I mean, thank you so much uh, for that. It's always strange to be introduced to someone who trains people in exposition because you think you're going to hear something like particularly good. And maybe I'm an example of what exposition is not supposed to be. Um, but I, uh, I, I do appreciate uh, your singing so much. Um, I had to pause our congregational singing Sunday night. I have a five-year-old, two uh, twin daughters in heaven, and then a five-year-old son. And he can't read yet, and we were singing Victory in Jesus, and he was there, you know, in the first row, and he was looking so close at my mouth so he could see, hear the words and see the words and then sing right after me that, I mean, I had to, I mean, I had to pause. What a, I mean, what a responsibility, right? I mean, our kids learn from us and what a, uh, what a, what a, a joy. Well, let's turn to Ruth uh, chapter four. That's all I want us to look at. These 12, really the first 12 verses of Ruth uh, chapter four under a message called A Tale of Two Redeemers. A Tale of Two Redeemers. I, I trust that many of us are familiar with the book of Ruth, and so kind of looking at this middle section together. So Ruth 4, 1 through 12. You remember that in the previous chapter, Boaz has made this sincere commitment, pledge to Ruth, that whatever happens, her family will be redeemed uh, on the following day. The question will be, will it be Boaz that will be this redeemer or this other redeemer? So chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the kinsman redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, Turn aside, my friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Then he, Boaz, took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he, Boaz, said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the fields of Moab, has to sell the portion of the field which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to uncover or inform you this uh, matter in your hearing, say, uh, saying, Acquire it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if no one redeems it, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you." And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the one who had died, in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance. So the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the right of redemption and the exchange of land to establish any, any matter. A man moved his sandal and gave it to another. This was the manner of attestation or testimony in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, acquire this for yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have acquired all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon from the hand of Naomi. And also I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance so that the name of the one who had died will not be cut off from his brothers or from the gate of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Two more verses. And all the people who were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. And may Yahweh grant the woman who is coming into your home to be like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And so you shall achieve excellence in Aphrathah or, or wealth and shall proclaim your name in Bethlehem. Moreover, may, may your house be like the house of Perez whom Tamar bore to Judah through the seed which Yahweh will grant you by this young woman. Let's just uh, pause for a brief prayer. Father, uh, help us now as we turn to your word. Um, as always, we are totally dependent on you to be our teacher. Help us to um, remember that this is your book and just in the same way that when I'm interacting with uh, the text messages of my wife or my friends, I'm actually inter interacting with a person. Father, that's what's happening when we come to your word. These are your words. So help us to be changed by it. Father, we delight to know that that's how your plans and your purposes come to fruition through the interaction of your powerful word to needy people that we might be changed. Father, help us to see this magnificent story of redemption and may it draw us to 
the one, the capital L Redeemer that we all need and we all love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, it's not, it's not hard to, uh, to see why Ruth is such a well-known and well-loved book. I think it might be maybe the most well-known and well-loved book of the Old Testament, probably because it's so short and it's masterfully written. It tells a compelling, uh, a compelling story. It has one of the most compelling themes known to fallen man, the theme of redemption. Um, you know, that word, the uh, redeem or a form of that word occurs 23 times in this little book, chiefly in the little section that we're looking at uh, today, that, that word redeem or redeemer, um, depending on how your translation translates that kinsman uh, redeemer f- um, figure in, in, the, in the book. We, we love stories of redemption, don't we? Aren't we drawn to them? I mean, from uh, Darth Vader sacrificing his life to save Luke from... Um, the Grinch, who literally had a, a heart change, I think about uh, Severus Snape and his secret commitment to pr- protect Harry. But perhaps one of the most enduring examples of redemption in literature was Victor Hugo's Jean Valjean in the movie Les Mis, which I say because I can't pronounce the, 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 actual, um, the actual work. And I was struck by reading Victor Hugo's appeal to his publisher to to um, really follow through on the commitment to publish that book because, as you know, Les Mis is such a a massive novel, 655,478 words in the original French. And the publisher is basically saying, how how are people going to buy this huge book? How are they going to read this huge book? And here's what he said. Listen to his words. I think it's so powerful. Here's what Victor Hugo said. I don't know whether it will be read by everyone, but it is meant for everyone. It addresses England as well as Spain, Italy as well as France, Germany as well as Ireland, the republics that harbor slaves as well as the empires that have serfs. Social problems go beyond frontiers. Humankind's wounds, those huge sores that litter the world, they do not stop at the blue and red lines drawn on our maps. So wherever men go in ignorance or despair... Wherever women sell themselves for bread, wherever children lack a book to learn from or a warm hearth, Les Mis knocks at the door and says, open up, I am here for you. I mean, isn't that powerful? Open up, I am here for for you. That is the call of redemption, is it not for all who have ears to hear? Open up, Obadiah, I'm here for you. Open up, I am here. Here for you. That's the call of Boaz to Ruth and Naomi in this powerful little book and their pitiful little position. It's also the call of, of Christ to us. Now, if you look down at the section before us, I think these 12 verses in Ruth are the most overlooked part of this most well known story. What I mean by that is, uh, trusting again that you're familiar with the book, you know, the, the main tension of the book of Ruth for the opening two chapters and halfway through chapter two is the question, will this family be redeemed? Isn't that what it's about? Will this family be rescued from their pitiful condi- condition? Will they have a redeemer? But in the middle of chapter three, the question and the tension shifts, not only simply to will they have a redeemer, but who will the redeemer be? From whom will redemption come? If you look back just in chapter 3, remember this, this midnight rendezvous between uh, Ruth and Boaz where she's basically, basically offering herself as a bride, a willing bride. The, the time of grieving for my de- uh, deceased husband is over. I'm now coming to you asking if you'll be my husband and a redeemer. This is what Boaz said in verse uh, 12. But now it is true of chapter 3, but now it is true I am a kinsman redeemer. Or, um, various translations, but I know it's, it's true. I am a kinsman redeemer. However, there is a kinsman redeemer closer than I. So stay this night and it will be in the morning, in the morning, that if he will redeem you good, let him redeem you. But if he does not desire to redeem you, then I will redeem you as Yahweh lives. Lie down until morning. Now, that is an important uh, transition. I think actually an overlooked transition because we all know the story of Ruth is ultimately about redemption. Is is redemption possible? Will redemption happen? And the answer is what? Yes, right? But in the middle of this book, the question changes from will redemption happen to from whom will redemption come? Will redemption come from any possible redeemer or will it come from the best possible redeemer? 
Uh, that's the way Boaz has been set out through this book. He's the man of eminent character, um, reputation, wealth, means, godliness. He greets people in the name of the Lord. He's a beautiful picture. And then out of nowhere in chapter 3, we have this other potential redeemer. Not simply another potential redeemer, someone who is in front of this redeemer who we've grown to love. And so the question is, from whom will redemption come? From Boaz, the redeemer we love? Or this other Redeemer who we know nothing about. Now, if you you look down, there are three scenes uh, that unfold in in these 12 verses. Three movements to to our story that that focus on the the, the actions of Boaz. And so that'll be our our outline. And we we think about this picture of Boaz, how it pushes us forward. Because I think this book is preparatory for our capital L Redeemer, the, the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus. But... Look at scene one. This is verses one and two. Boaz initiates the process of redemption. Boaz initiates the process of redemption. Keeping his promise from the the night before, Boaz sets up, literally secures the events that will ensure Naomi and Ruth are redeemed by the end of the day. Again, look at these verses. Now, Boaz went up to the gate. Here, He said, uh, and the following night it would be in the morning, and that's what, what we trust it was. Now, Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold... The kinsman redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. Isn't that just so uh, coincidental? He just happens uh, to pass by. It's, it's God's, or God never speaks in the story, but he's in all the, the details. And so Boaz speaks to him and says, Turn aside, my fellow or my friend, sit down here. And in his reputation and character and influence, the man listens and, and sits down. Then he, Boaz, took ten men of the elders of the city, the people of official status and ruling opinion and authority. He gets ten of those men and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Boaz initiates the process of redemption. Now, there are three essential elements of the redeeming process. Someone who needs to be redeemed, a willing redeemer, and witnesses. Okay, is everybody tracking with me? Too complicated? You want me to get a marker and draw it out on this board? Yeah, no, you need a family that needs to be redeemed. You need a redeemer, and then you need witnesses to officiate this act of redemption. Now we know we have the family that obviously needs to be redeemed. Ruth in the events of the last the previous night revealed that she wants to be redeemed. And we know that Ruth or Boaz is pledged to be a redeemer if this other guy turns down. The only thing they need is who will be the secu- the, the sure redeemer and the, the witnesses. And that's what Boaz is doing in these first two verses in a very speedily, quickly uh, manner. Now, you don't have to turn here with me. You, you might if you're you know, um, proficient in the Old Testament. There are, there are two key Old Testament passages that kind of un- undergird what's happening here for our clarity, and that's Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 25. You can turn there. You can write them on your notes. I'll read the passages for you. But you can't really understand what's going to take place in this conversation in the unfolding verses ahead without considering the, the background of these two passages. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10, and Leviticus 25, uh, 13 through 17. But here's Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And it's speaking of the, the Old Testament practice of Leverite marriage, the, the custom of, of making sure family lines always had a descendant to possess and maintain the land that was allotted at the time of, uh, of Joshua. So this is Deuteronomy 25, uh, 5. Now when brothers live uh, together and one of them dies and has no son... The wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family, outside this particular initial line, to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be, and this is the most important part of this section, it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother, so that his name, the dead brother's name, will not be blotted out, forgotten, lost in in the history of Israel. But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He's not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the city shall summon him and they speak to him. They're trying to talk him into his responsibility and, and opportunity here. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, right? they're not going to force him. Um, well, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders. Here it is. Pull his sandal off his foot spit in his face, and she shall declare, thus it is done 
to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel, his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. All right, that's a, that's, a, a weighty, that's a weighty passage. But this is the background here. This family needs redemption. This plot of land needs to stay in this family line. And the way that was um, taken care of was having a, a, a near sibling take on. And remember, this is so foreign to us, but again, we can't have a, a cultural superiority over the cultures of the, the Old Testament. But I mean, think about it. Wherever you live, how do you know who um, owns the, hand, the land of your neighbor? How do you know that? Well, there are people there. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's there's people there that, that live there, and they can trace back, right? Especially in the, in the ancient world where people lived and died within usually 75 miles of where they were born. You can say, listen, this is the house that my dad lived in, and my grandpa lived in, and my great grandpa lived. We can trace back all the lines here. It was all about having a permanent resident on the land to say, listen, this is land has always been in our family. That's what they're trying to preserve here. And so that, that's what's going on here. The other background passage, and just quickly, Le- Leviticus 25, uh, 13 through 17, speaks of how the land uh, in Israel was bought and sold. Right? Because it's not the way that land is bought and sold in our day. Because when we buy land, who does it belong to? Us. When Israel bought land from an, one another, who did, it, who did it belong to? God. It was God's land. And so you were never selling this plot. You were selling years of fruitful crops on this, this land. And you'll, you'll get what I, say, uh, what I mean. Uh, Leviticus 25, 13 through 17, um, uh, starting in 13, it says, On this year of Jubilee, which is every 50 years, on this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property. There was basically, um, was Jubilee 50 years or 500 years? I, I just did this off the top of my head. Okay, I, I, was, I was having... Questions in my mind in this book. Okay, yeah. So 50 years, each shall return to his own property. Uh, his own property is basically a land re- reset. And here's the line. If you make a sale, moreover, to your friend or buy from your friend's hand, you shall not wrong one another. Corresponding to the number of years after the Jubilee, you shall buy from your friend. He is to sell you according to the number of cr- uh, years of crops. In proportion to the extent of the years, you shall increase its price. And in proportion to the fewness of the years, you shall diminish its price. For it is a number of crops he's selling you. So you shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God. Fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your your God. And so when Naomi here is offering to sell the land, she's offering, she's selling a number of, of crops. How many crops are going to go, which will sustain her family in the meantime. And regardless of how close she is to this 50 years, what's going to happen when the 50 year line comes? It's going to go back to her. And if she's still in, a, in a, a state of need, what can she do again? She can lease out her land Again, that's what's going to happen in this story. Because of her great need, their great need, Naomi is, going to, is selling Elimelech's ancestral property um, in the meantime. Now, what I want to emphasize, and we're spending long, longer here on these two verses than we will the, the rest of the passage, so don't be discouraged. But what I want to emphasize is how Boaz is so clearly the initiator of this process, isn't he? Especially if you're going to talk about, I think the heart of this passage is the contrast between this other redeemer and Boaz, I mean, the contrast starts here. One redeemer is doing everything necessary to make sure what takes place. Redemption. Right? He's in the morning. He's saying, hey, uh, can you sit here for a minute? And he's going to find that the ten, el- ten elders, official rulers, witnesses for this says, hey, you guys, can, can you come with me for a second? You, you sit here. He's initiating the process of redemption. What is this other redeemer doing? He is in the in the the primary position of a redeemer, but what is he in doing uh, do, doing in the background to ensure the well being of this family? Nothing. He's just going about his day. He just happens to be going through the gate at the at the right time. What I love about this passage is it it portrays to us Boaz is his eagerness, his initiative to make sure redemption happens for this needy family. He's not described as a a reluctant redeemer, as a hesitant redeemer, not even as a redeemer who's willing to put it off. He's a redeemer who takes the initiative, who ensures that redemption will take place. Who does this remind you of? 
I remember Brian, Brian Chapel says uh, in Christ Center Preaching, when we're reading the Old Testament, you have to remember it's, it's, it's a part of one big story. Every individual story is a part of a, a bigger story. And so there's messianic prophecies about uh, Christ. There is patterns that real um, Christ. But the, the biggest picture is it's preparing us for Christ. It's preparing us for the redemption that we're going to have in, in Him. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished on us. You say, well, um, uh, Brother Josh, I think you're going, you're way too strong with this Christ connection stuff and trying to say Yahweh or Boaz is a, a redeemer that's like Jesus in here. No, that, that's, that's the way the storyline works. You remember when, when Ruth comes, Ruth and Naomi come back in their, um, in their destitution and she says, you, you know, Yahweh has, he's, he, I went out full, he brought me back uh, empty. Um, the next day or, or so, Ruth is in, the, uh, is in Boaz's field and she's working a hard, uh, um, very hard and she has this conversation with Boaz. And what does Boaz say to her? He says, may Yahweh, may, may you find peace, rest under Yahweh's wings which you fled for, for refuge. May you find re rest in, in Yahweh's wings. And then you remember the conversation at the, the threshing floor at, at midnight? What does uh, Ruth say to uh, Boaz? You cover me with your wings. You be the representative of, of Yahweh in my, in my life. And that's, that's why we read it, this initiative-making redeemer. I mean, it's what, what I sang you know, last night with my... Son, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Loved ones, this is the start of the contrast between Boaz's actions and the, the actions of this other potential redeemer. One is totally active. One is totally passive. One is actively seeking a family's well-being and their redemption. The other one is simply going about his, his day. That brings us to number two, the, the second movement, the second scene, actually the most important scene in this unfolding story. Not, not only does Boaz initiate the process of redemption, but notice Boaz accepts the cost of redemption. He accepts it, which is, is the contrast between this other redeemer. This is verses 3 through 10. Now, with the background of uh, Deuteronomy 25 and Leviticus 25, let's read this passage s slower so we can um, kind of fill in the pieces in the background with that uh, cultural data. Verse 3, so this is going to Boaz accepting the cost of redemption in contrast to this other redeemer. Then he said, Boaz said the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the fields of Moab, has to sell the portion of the field which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So however close we are to this 50-year jubilee mark, she's selling the crops so that she can have sustenance for herself until that time comes and the land goes back to her. Verse 4, So I thought to uncover, reveal this matter in your hearing, saying, Acquire it, you buy it, you possess it before those who are sitting here in an official way, before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if no one redeems it, tell me that I may know, for there's no one to redeem it but, uh, but, but you, and I, I am after you. And he said, I will redeem it. I, I'll take on the initial cost of this purchase. I, I'll do it, right? Now, he has a lot of benefits to do it. Why? Because it's, he's not buying a year, a, a piece of land in, perpetu in, in perpetuity. He's, he's buying it for a certain number of years. It's got a lot of potential to increase his wealth, right? Doesn't it not? All this... This land, the, the, the produce of this land will, will enrich his family, enrich his inheritance, will enrich his name. He initially says, I will redeem it. But then the, the change happens, verse 5. Then Boaz said, after this man already has expressed his absolute willingness to redeem this land, then Boaz says, listen, on the day you acquire the field, right, you don't just get a piece of property that has years of fruitfulness. No, on the day you acquire the field from the, the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the one who had died in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance. So it's not just an opportunity here that you're, you're assuming for yourself, unnamed redeemer. It's a responsibility. And you, not only do we have to care for aging um, Naomi in her widow years, which is going to be uh, what you're doing with the, the money that you, you give her and then whatever she needs, but you're also getting this this young woman who's not just any one young woman, she's Ruth the Moabitess. 
the one, um, the wife of the one who, who died. And this, this changes things, does it not? Does, does the man say, oh, sure, that's not, not a big deal. You know, I, I would be glad to take this opportunity and this response. No, verse 6, which is the key verse of this section. So the kinsman redeemer said, now that he knows the full details of this transaction, the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for my Self. I'll just pause there. Uh, my translation has kinsmen in italics because it, the, the translator is, is putting in there, and in there for, for our help. But literally, here's how it reads in the Hebrew. So the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it. The Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it. Now, what's wrong with that statement? That's what Redeemers do. Right now, it, it's it's not simply about being in a position of redemption. You have to be in the uh, a position to be a redeemer positionally, status uh, with your status officially. But it's not simply about being in a position to re- redeem somebody. You also have to be willing to do it. Willing to do it. And this is no, I I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin. Some translations have endanger or impair. Um, King James Mar, New American Standard, and jeopardize, lest I jeopardize my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, we'll come back to this verse in a second, but notice the, the narrator in, inserts a cultural background uh, from that Deuteronomy passage to help us understand what's going on here in verse 7. Now, this was the custom in form, former times in Israel concerning the right of redemption and exchange of land to establish any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. In other words, they, they moved past this whole very disgraceful lady pulling off the, the sandal and spitting on the face. They're trying to save face in all this. Now you're simply, you remove your sandal, you give it to another. Th- this was the manner of attestation in, in Israel. So they're, they've already moved beyond what God has said and they're, they're, they're cleaning up the, um, really the, what was meant to be a very heartbreaking situation. So you're saying you're willing out of personal pride and trying to protect your own inheritance, you're willing to let your brother's name die in Israel. I mean, that, 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 isn't that what's happening here? Right? Out of your own preference, you're willing to let, throughout history and generations, nobody even know who your brother was. It's a, it's a shocking thing. Now, the, the reason I, I say I think this is the most overlooked part of this overlooked section is verse 6. I don't think most of us has, have dealt... Um, strongly enough with this man's rejection. So let's look at it again together. The kinsman, verse 6, the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I ruin my own inheritance. Now you read all the commentaries or all the scholars and they say it's a very, it's a very strong word. It's a very strong word. It means destroy. It means to corrupt. Uh, I preach out of the New American Standard 95. Uh, usually I'm using a different translation here because I get it's, it's more uh, clear in this passage because I, I hate the way the New, New American Standard translates kinsman redeemer. The, the close relative says, I think that's very confusing, but it's, it's a great translation. That's what I normally use. But all the, the, the uh, commentators and, and the scholars, they say this, this, this man, he must be... Um, using language bigger than he, he's trying to make a point here. Surely he's not going to ruin his, his inheritance. That's why the New Mingers puts jeopardize because it's not um, an automatic ruin. You don't automatically ruin your inheritance by taking on Ruth the Mo- Moabitess. It's a potential ruin of your inheritance. All right, now here's, here's the question, and I, I w- want you all to think about this because I think we, most of us you know, ha- haven't thought about this. How? How does taking Ruth the Moabitess potentially potentially ruin this man's inheritance. Well, the first thing the commentators say, well, it, it'll ruin it by d- dilution. In other words, this man has a wife probably already. He's got sons already. All of his her- inheritance is going to go to these boys. And so if he possess his boys, his family. And so if um, he takes this land and uh, Naomi, who's beyond the, the, the years for childbearing, if he takes this land, she can't produce an heir and she dies. His inheritance just gets bigger. Right? The whole thing gets bigger. But if Ruth, if he takes on Ruth and he has to be married to her and he has to produce an heir for her, well, then the heir that he produces with Ruth, he's going to get this field. And because he's actually a part of the both, both, uh, both lines, he's going to get a, a portion of the other son's um, uh, inheritance. He doesn't want to ruin his inheritance that way. It's a, it's a ruining by dilution. Actually, I don't think that's what's happening here, respectfully. <laughs> I think it's... There's really two ways that this marriage can ruin his inheritance. It can ruin it reputationally, and it can ruin it uh, financially. Here's what I mean. 
You know, uh, the, the first verse of, of uh, Ruth says it happened in the days when the judges judged, right? So this is the, that's the historical context. How did the, the Israelites feel about the Moabites at the time of judges and numbers and not good. They were their enemies. They were strong enemies. Now, we know that Ruth has pro um, proved to be an exception to the rule because of her mighty character. But who, does that mean that Moabites now are eligible women to be married to? Well, to one redeemer eligible, the, the, other, the other not. Um, rep, there's a, a reputational um, uh, thread here, and particularly because and there's, no, there's no reason these characters in the moment knew that they were going to be a part of one of the best stories, you know, incredible stories in the Bible. There's the fear that what happens in the next generation and the next generation who forget about Ruth's has said that she showed Naomi. They forget about what a, a wonderful, wonderful Moabitess Ruth was. What happens three, four generations down the line when they don't know how great Ruth was and all they see is, of this family's line is the family that intermarried with our enemies. That, that's the way his, his inheritance could be ruined because of the um, reputational damage. But I think more, more probable is the financial ruin this man is uh, afraid of. And here's what I mean here. It's, it, you have the initial financial cost of buying the number of, of years. And so if it's 49 years until the next Jubilee, you're, that's a big amount of money. If it's 15 years, it's less. But whatever, there's initial cost. Then there's a long-term cost of making sure that you, 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 you're taking up the, the workers on the land for those years. You've got to take care of age and Naomi. Um, there's just long-term costs involved. But... In particularly, and this is what I believe, just from the, the reading of the story and the fact that the, the Bible tells us Boaz doesn't have any other kids, he doesn't have any other wives. It seems like the only the only um, child from this union produced for, it, from Boaz's line comes from from Ruth, we, who we know is the great grandpa of David, who's going to be in the line of Jesus. But we're kind of getting getting ahead. The, the way it could really ruin a line is that if you were not married and you had all this inheritance that you got from your parents and now you have the opportunity to opportunity and responsibility to step in for your your dead brother your dead kinsman and take on his wife and you produce an heir through her the first heir will get everything of your brothers but what if she doesn't have any more kids what if she only produces one son then what will happen to your stuff well your stuff becomes a limit stuff your line gets swallowed up in his line. The same thing that would have happened to Elimelech's line if um, the boys would have died without being married and Naomi would have died after she was able to produce children. Right? Would we know about Elimelech's line in the Bible? No, it had been lost. It had been totally lost. And that's, I think, what this man is afraid of. He's, he's saying, if I take on this line and she produces only one heir, all, if she, all my stuff will become Elimelech's stuff. My line could literally be ruined. Now the powerful thing, loved ones, about this section is, is this potential ruin for this family line, is it greater for this unnamed redeemer than it is for, for Boaz? Is it a unique threat to him or is it a threat that applies to both of them? Yeah, it applies to both and actually it applies to Boaz greater. Why? Who's the wealthier man? Who has the more means? Who has much more to lose? Who has an inheritance that's greater? That's why it says Boaz was willing to accept the cost of redemption. Both men were under this possible threat, this possible loss of inheritance. Boaz doesn't know how it's going to turn out. He doesn't know if Ruth can produce him an heir for Elimelech and then another heir for his own stuff. He doesn't know any of that. But he's willing to accept the cost. One man is concerned about his name, his inheritance, his reputation. The other man is concerned about the name and well-being inheritance of a needy family with nowhere else to go. That's what verse 9 and, and 10 are about. Verse 9, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have acquired all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon from the hand of Naomi, and also I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the one who had died on behalf of his inheritance so that the name of the one who had died will not be cut off from his brothers or from the gate of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. You see the, the, the contrast between these two redeemers? One is so concerned about protecting his own name, his own inheritance, his own future status. And the other redeemer, Boaz, says what? I'm willing. I'm willing to take that cost. 
I'm willing to assume that threat. I'm willing to enter into that realm of jeopardy. Boaz accepts the cost of redemption. The initial cost of buying the land and, and making sure that Naomi's taken care of, the long-term cost of providing for two women for the rest of their, their lives, and the potential cost of losing all your line in the single heir that Ruth is able to produce. That, that willingness is the essential contrast of these two redeemers in this, in this book. How can we not think of Christ here? I mean, isn't that right? I mean, how can you not think of a redeemer who's willing to take the cost? I mean, that's what the book has been doing. It's been setting Boaz up as a Yahweh-like figure. He's supposed to be a, a type of the, the compassion and the, and the hesed and the redemption and the love that comes from Yahweh. And this redeemer in this human man is a redeemer willing to take the cost of redemption, even though he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. Lovelace, does Jesus know the cost of redemption? It's not a, a, a potential cost. Jesus knew that it would cost him what? His life. He knew it would cost him um, bearing up under the, the wrath of his, of his father. But Boaz was willing to do it out of compassion, out of mercy. It's the same with, with Jesus. Jesus knew full well what it would cost him to redeem his people. It wasn't a, a potential jeopardy. It was, it was certain death, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You were, you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of the lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And number three, just real quickly, number three, we'll be done. The, the third scene, Boaz receives the blessing of redemption. This is the capstone of this section where the witnesses affirm the transaction has taken place and they pronounce a very important blessing on this new um, couple, really over, over Boaz. So verse 11, And all the people who were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. We're, we, we are official status here. May Yahweh... And this is the, the to total opposite of what this other Redeemer feared. So it's a blessing that what this re other Redeemer feared would not come to pass for Boaz, but the opposite would be true. May Yahweh grant the woman who is coming into your life, in your home, be like Rachel and Leah. Right? How many children came from that union? Well, he, he, he said both of whom, they built the house of Israel. This one Redeemer is so afraid that only one heir will be produced. Well, Boaz, here's our prayer for you, that, that, that Ruth will, will produce um, so many kids, it'll be like those who built the house of Israel. So you shall achieve excellence, I think a, a better translation is wealth. Maybe, not, maybe uh, th this man is worried that his wealth will diminish. We're saying may your wealth increase in Ephrathah and, and proclaim your name in Bethlehem. He's so afraid of, uh, of um, his name being lost. We, we pray that more people know your name. Verse 12, Moreover, may your house be like the, uh, the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the seed, which Yahweh will grant you by this young woman, a, a promise of a future great leader through this line. Now, we have the advantage of knowing that all this blessing did what? It came true with an exception. Ruth in the storyline doesn't produce a whole litter of children so that she so that this family line can can Caroline both the Limelech's line and Boaz's line. Through history, we says they only produce one one son, but he's a he's a an important one. Just later at the, the book in verse 17, the the women and uh, the neighbor women gave him a name, this new son born from this union. A son has been born to Naomi. That's why, because her, her line gets to continue. Her husband's line gets to continue. And they name him Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. One line, one name is forgotten. We have no, no idea what this other redeemer's name was. And Boaz's line gets swallowed up in this other line, but we all know his name. Actually, the wording is they, they pray he becomes famous. Is Boaz famous? Is he famous in the church? Who are we talking about today? Yeah, why? Because he's willing to assume the cost and, and, and therefore he receives the blessing of redemption. And it's through this son that David will come. And as you know, eventually the Lord, the Lord Jesus, the Redeemer, coming through the willingness of this Redeemer, Jesus, the greater Boaz. Let, let me close this way and we'll pray. I know we're a little bit over, but... This book surrounds or rallies around the theme, Ruth needed redemption. She desperately needed redemption. And she got it. 
And she didn't get it just through any possible redeemer. She got it through the best possible redeemer. That's what the book is teaching us because the, the, the same is true for us. We needed redemption. Desperately needed redemption. More than this family needed redemption. We needed redemption from our sins and being under the wrath of God. And in Christ, we have, we have it. And Jesus is not just a redeemer, loved ones. He's the best possible redeemer, isn't he? He's, he's a, a willing redeemer, an eager redeemer, the, the best uh, redeemer. May we live uh, for him. Let, let, let me pray for us. Father, let's think about this uh, this treasure of a section and uh, what I think the clear connection to the redemption that we have in you. Father, help us realize this is, we're not allegorizing this passage. This is a true story that really happened. But Father, we're also people that believe in your sovereignty so much that history isn't happening. It's unfolding. It's revealing a, a plan. And Father, we, we have to ask ourselves, why is this other potential redeemer even a part of this story? He comes out of nowhere in the narrative. But we know you're in control of that. So help us to see what you're teaching us, Father, that it's not simply that you've provided redemption for fallen, broken people in the Lord Jesus, but that Jesus is the best possible redeemer. Father, help us to take on the character of of Ruth, who was so committed to her mother-in-law that, that, that she would sacrifice uh, a secure future by um, pursuing a younger man, but she actually seeks the Redeemer not simply for her own benefit, but from her, for her mother-in-law's benefit. Father, help us to assume the character of Boaz, who saw the need of others, and he saw he was in a position to, to meet that need, and he also had a posture of willingness uh, to meet that need. Well, help us all to be propelled by this story forward to think about the great Redeemer of our souls, the Lord Jesus, that we might live for Him. It's in His name we pray. Amen.